Across the fence, we'll get a glimpse into the meticulous creation of a sand mandala by two Tibetan monks. And the latest research on maple syrup is being tested at the UVM Proctor Maple Research Center. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. We begin today's program by focusing on a unique Vermont tradition. Green Up Day is this Saturday, May 3rd. Volunteers will go road by road, town by town, picking up bag after bag of roadside litter. To learn more about Green Up Day in your hometown, you can call Green Up's toll-free number. That's 1-800-974-3259. You can also find information on the website. Go to greenupvermont.org. Well, joining me now is a longtime president of Green Up Vermont, Melinda View. Good to see you again. Thank you. Now, tell me a little bit about how things are shaping up for Saturday. They're shaping up well. Um, we already have people that we know are visiting the website. There's a lot of information on the website, including a lot about how to participate mm -hmm. and who is the town coordinator in each town. And so what can people expect as far as a time commitment if they want to volunteer? It, their choice. Um, one to four hours. Some people stay more than four hours. So it's, it's really a, up to individual choice. Now there was some concern recently about the future of Green Up after several corporate sponsors pulled out, but you've found new sponsors. We have. Uh, Green Mountain Power stepped up in a big way and made a commitment for three years with a substantial amount of, of influx of funding. And we recognize that we've been very successful at Green Up um, depending on corporations for funding support. Support, but we need to we need to decrease our dependency on them due to you know just a change in the pattern of giving, mm -hmm. and so we want it's important for us to increase individual giving. We have very little individual giving. People don't think we need money, and people don't realize that Green Up Vermont is a nonprofit charitable organization. It's not a state agency that runs Green Up Day. And it takes obviously money, and I think people take Green Up Day sort of for granted because there is such a rich history. It happens every year. People turn up, you know, to volunteer to help out, but they don't really think too much about what goes on the rest of the year just to make sure that this happens every year. That's right. That's really a, an important statement. People take Green Up Day for granted, both in terms of funding and in terms of participating. There, if you, it's just not at, on everybody's top priority for the day list. And mm -hmm. if you look at the calendars and see all the other things that are going on on Green Up Day, it's like, come on, <laughs> uh, let's at least share the day. And I, I wish everyone would take part in one way or another. If you can't go out and volunteer to pick up, please donate. And you can do that easily by going to the Green Up website and donate securely online. Mm -hmm. And even a small donation counts. Absolutely. And so volunteers are another critical piece of Green Up. How many people do you expect to volunteer their time on Saturday? Thousands, um, over 15,000, headed toward 20,000. We're never certain that mm -hmm. the number varies. And we're trying something new this year. On our website, you can be counted because we know that a lot of people do go out and clean up on Green Up Day, but nobody knows that they've done it. Mm -hmm. So we're giving this opportunity to folks to be counted. So for several years you sponsored an educational program too, or a couple of them around Green Up Day, a writing con contest and a poster contest. And the winner of this year's poster contest is Alyssa Barrett. She's a senior at Montpelier High School. And we're going to take a look at her winning poster. There it is. What did the judges have to say about her work? They think it's, it's, um, it really sends the message. It's very Vermont, meticulously done, and a, a rendition of the Vermont Quarter. But at the same time, it brings in Green Up bags. Yeah, I love that. And so we also want to recognize Kylie Dunshi of Heinsburg. Kylie's a seventh grader who won the top prize in Green Up's writing contest. So congratulations to her as well. And I know you want to read her. I do want her to. Entry. Green Up Day is an important day to everyone. Green Up Day helps our planet to be cleaner and helps our planet to go into a positive direction. If we just let litter build up, disease could start or animals could go extinct from 
eating, the clutter. If we continue to have Green Up Day, our world will begin to be less cluttered every year. Green Up Day gets everyone in a positive mood, makes the world a cleaner place. In conclusion, Green Up Day is a great tradition to make the world cleaner. Hopefully one day there will be no more littering and everyone can throw away their trash responsibly. That Wouldn't that nice. be great? That's a great <laughs> thought. Now tell me a little bit about how someone can volunteer if they haven't already. They can just find out who is the coordinator in mm -hmm. their town, either by calling the Green Up office or by going online to the Green Up website, greenupvermont.org. And we have how to participate. There's a list for every county, for every town, who's the coordinator, how to contact them, and in many cases, what the activity is going to look like in their town. Okay, once again, we want to just reiterate what the, the uh, toll-free number is, 1-800-974-3259. That's 1-800-974-3259. Volunteer if you can, if you can't, donate. And, you know, if you're driving around, too, and you see folks who are picking up trash on the side of the road, slow down. You might even want to stop and thank them. Well, that would be nice. <laughs> All right, Linda, thank you so much. Our next segment takes us to the University of Vermont's Proctor Maple Research Center. New research is ongoing that provides a glimpse into what could be the future of sugaring. Keith Silva has a story. In theory, maple sugaring hasn't changed for centuries. Put a hole in a tree, collect the sap, and boil. The difference nowadays is in the practice. The image that many people have of maple sugaring is still that we're using a lot of buckets and, and tractors or horses to draw around a, a sledge, and that's really not the way maple is done any longer. For 68 years, scientists at the University of Vermont Proctor Maple Research Center have studied and tested maple trees. What starts here as a question or observation becomes an experiment, which in turn leads to changes in the maple industry. Proctor Maple has helped in refining tools like tubing, vacuum pumps, and reverse osmosis to allow sugar makers to maximize yields and get the most out of the short and sweet season. Maple is all about flow. On average, it takes 40 years for a maple tree to be mature enough to tap. At least, that's what most of us used to think. So we were doing an experiment looking at where sap comes from in the tree, particularly under vacuum. We, we understand quite well how sap moves in trees normally, but with vacuum we're moving the sap around quite a bit more. So during the course of that investigation, we found that for at least part of the flow period, we were pulling water right out of the ground, through the roots, up through the stem and out of the tap hole. And in doing that, we decided that if that were in fact true, that the top became immaterial. And so to test that, we went and cut the top off a small tree and started to pull vacuum on it to collect the sap and then found out that we could, uh, in fact, get quite a, a good amount of sap from the tree in that manner. It definitely does not appear anything like traditional maple triggering, other than the fact that we're using tubing. That's right. Sap from saplings. Certainly, there are a lot of uh, head scratches and what, you know, sort of, oh, that's interesting. But, you know, I think we thought about this and worked on this for a long time without really being able to talk about it. The research into tapping saplings began in 2010. Abby Vandenberg worked with Perkins to make this discovery. The fundamental level at which I operate is scientists interested in how trees work. And from that level, this has been, you know, just a really neat um, research topic to explore. Does this work physiologically? What is the physiology involved? This is very similar in some ways to lots of other existing agriculture. So as someone interested in agriculture, it just kind of seems like a natural extension of practices that we already use. To me, this represents one other tool in the toolbox for producers that might have some obstacles to expanding their operation. This technology is still years away from being commercially available. Vandenberg and Perkins expect this plantation approach will benefit sugar makers with land constraints or as a way to recoup losses after storm damage in seven years instead of 40. No matter how beneficial this approach may become, Perkins knows they'll be doubters. 
I think the general public really just needs to understand more about the process when they first hear about it. We're you know, killing baby trees um, and, and that it's something that they think might, might swamp the, the maple world with syrup and could harm maple producers or, or that the syrup is going to be different. Well, it isn't. It, it, the syrup is exactly the same. It's made by trees. It's sugar they're just pulling out of a tree. Um, in terms of killing young trees, this doesn't kill them. They actually uh, do quite well. They'll they'll continue to live for a long period of time. The perception is is sometimes uh, not the same as the reality, and I think people, once they understand the process, will will accept it more. No matter if a maple is stately or skinny, the sap won't run up or down without cycles of freezing and thawing. When it comes to sugaring. It's Mother Nature who gets the final say. Over time, uh, I think the plantation method is probably going to become more and more uh, commonplace. It's going to take a long period of time. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, it's similar in many ways to lots of other crops. So if you look at vineyards, very, very different than they were a long time ago. Apple orchards, very, very different. New technology changing all the time. Um, Christmas tree plantations. If you would ask your grandfather uh, about going to cut a Christmas tree, you would not have gone to a plantation. They're, they just didn't exist back then. And now it's a very uh, strong tradition for people to go out and cut their Christmas trees in a plantation. And so just over a couple of generations, things change. Um, and we don't really perceive them because they're happening over that kind of time frame, but they do change quite a lot. As this plantation method shows, the experiments at the Proctor Maple Research Center always sugar off to a greater understanding of the world around us. In Underhill Center, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Well, our final segment this afternoon takes us to the Fleming Museum at UVM. Earlier this month, two Tibetan monks spent a week at the museum creating a sand mandala. Mandalas are complex symbolic structures with many layers of meaning and beauty. Every color, dot, and line in the mandala represents an essential part of the Buddhist philosophy. Here's a look as the two monks at the Fleming neared the completion of their mandala.
Well, for more information about the Fleming Museum, including a schedule of ex exhibitions, you can check out the website on your screen. It's theflemingmuseum.org. That's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Thank you.